You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 131. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and foes, I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm a professional circus artist and the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you want to know more about me, who I am, what I'm about, there's a ton of ways to learn more about me. You can go all the way back to episode zero if you want to hear my story. And you can also check me out on patreon.com slash the artist athlete. Patreon is the way that this podcast gets funded. And it's also where I provide little behind the scenes sneak peek, extra special looks at my life with a weekly recording that's Patreon only that's just about my journeys being a professional circus artist and also a not professional human being. It's pretty cool. Go check it out. Patreon.com slash the artist athlete. My guest today is Erica LeMay. Canadian-born Erica LeMay has become a beautifully disruptive icon in the world of live performance. As the creator of physical poetry, Erica believes that poetry doesn't have to be expressed with words. Her TV performances have been seen by more than 400 million viewers worldwide. She received countless accolades in international circus competitions, and her talent has been featured in worldwide media, including Vanity Fair, Glamour Magazine, Hello Magazine, Le Figaro, and La Republica. She has performed extensively as a solo guest star with Cirque du Soleil, whilst developing the unique artistic language that makes her famous today. Vanity Fair Italy nominated Erica as the new Queen of Circus in an interview featuring exclusive pictures by legendary photographer and Hollywood icon maker Douglas Kirkend, whose latest book, Physical Poetry Alphabet, is a tribute to Erica's work. Already an authority in the world of high-end events, Erica draws upon two decades of expertise to create, direct, and produce bespoke shows for the most exclusive special event scene around the planet. In 2021, she launched Lima Lab, featuring a supplement line specifically created for physical artists. Her first nonfiction book, Almost Perfect, has recently been published worldwide. I can't wait for you to hear my interview with Erica LeMay. Erica LeMay, welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you. And I'm double happy to have you because I think you're the most prepared guest of any guest I've ever had on this podcast. <laughs> like, you sent me question and answer sheets. You sent me a whole, like, write-up of your book. You like, thank you. You're so prepared. Mm -hmm. I think it's better to be overprepared, prepared and then you pretend that you're talented that way. <laughs> That's super wise. I want to get into that a little bit more, but before I do, um, can you tell the people at home who you are and what you do? Yes. So Shannon just told you my name, so I won't repeat that one. I uh, am a performer but I'm also show director and creator and even producer nowadays with my physical poetry. And uh, during this marvelous um, pandemic, I became the CEO of a um, health company that helps performers like us to lengthen our career and uh, try not to need surgeons too often. Um, and we produce a line of supplement for performers and uh, yeah. But uh, the basics of myself is uh, an eternal learner and, uh, yeah, someone of arts, producing, creating. So I want to take it back all the way to the beginning, back to baby Erica. When did you start knowing that you were a performer? At four years old, when I um, first stepped on stage and I wished that 
everyone else would go away. I was doing a little ballet show <laughs> <laughs> with uh, maybe another 12 uh, clumsy ballerinas with me. And I wanted to have the stage to myself. It was very natural. And uh, even if I'm quite reserved, like not shy, but reserved as a person, I love to own the stage and I knew it right away. What was the trajectory from there? I did ballet from four to seven and uh, seven, eight. And then I was upgraded in a group of uh, 12 years old or something. So I started not to have fun anymore, not to be challenged either anymore. Started gymnastics because I wanted to artistic gymnastics. That said, not rhythmic. There was no rhythmic in my little village. And um, so I just wanted to flip in the air, go to the Olympic. And um, so that was from nine to 11. And I was terrible at gymnastics. My proportions were completely wrong. I was too tall, like uh, a bit of a stick that doesn't <laughs> help in gymnastics. And um, I eventually, at 11 years old, my best friend at gymnastics, she introduced me to circus. She was doing these little circus classes on Saturdays in her little village as well. Like I really come from countryside. And um, once I went with her a Saturday and the owner or the the guy that was teaching us circus, who was a clown popoff, uh, he founded then the circus school of Quebec City. And um, but at the time, it was just the circus troupe and the very, let's say, the the good circus uh, students slash performers were training all together on Sundays in Quebec City, which was a big city for us. I come from, let's remember, Saint Etienne de Lausanne, where there are cows and. Uh, and a lot of nothingness. <laughs> so my friend and I, we went and I completely fell in love with how people are different in the circus arts. And also they all have a huge personality, let's say. Everyone, <laughs> everyone it's not like a little army of the same type of person or physique. It's so vast as, a, as an art form that uh, yeah, I completely fell in love with that, and we started to do a little duo in the air on the narrow hoop. Um, I think the first day I was there. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you, from day one, were just an aerial hoop artist. Yeah, funny enough, yeah, in duo at first. I actually did the, <laughs> the Circus Festival of, uh, of Paris, or Cirque de Demain, in 99 when I was a kid uh, in duo. One of the questions that popped out to me on your sheet was that you started your professional career when you were just a child. Mm -hmm. How do you define a professional career, first of all? Like, what does that mean to you? How I, let's say, put the line for the sake of calling it professional career is yeah. uh, when I signed my first professional contract as being hired mm -hmm. and getting a salary to perform for a company, which was Sir Chaos at the time, that died uh, somewhere in 2003, I think. And I was 13, so I became a quote-unquote professional at 13, although I could say I was a professional before because I was getting paid to do little gigs here and there between 11 and 13. But at 13, I got the chance to be included in the first show of Sergeos International Launch, and I started to travel the world and pretty much spent my teenage years touring with that company. But it was not Cirque du Soleil, so that, that meant no nanny, no school system, no nothing. So I really needed to organize myself to ask uh, the, the schools, everything. I had to find solution pretty much for being away all the time and doing my schooling by correspondence and traveling as a minor, having nobody really being in charge of me and convincing everyone all the time that it was okay for me to miss that and I would have grades of 95% if they let me go and then if I did not have that at school then they could take me back thinking things like that everything was a negotiation at that age already oh my gosh so you were 13 and just kind of like out in the well obviously not out in the world you were working but no one where your parents agreed to this what were they what was their kind of like <laughs> input of all that Oh my God. I think they were not um, conscious of how free I was. I think they thought I was much more under surveillance than I was. <laughs> um, yeah, no, because it was completely free for all. People forgot that I was so young, even like 14, 15, when I was really 
even I spent a lot of time in my teenage years in South America because we happened to be touring there. And I mean, this is wild and nobody was protecting me. I could come back. I like to to train at night after the show. So I would talk to mm-hmm. the technicians, ask them to just leave one one light there so I could continue to, I like to always uh, improve and train, 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 train. <laughs> so and then I would come back walking at night like in a country with no phones nothing like you could not find me if i get i got kidnapped but uh, i think my parents just did not know because they they were not very free parents they were i would say mm, just responsible as a parent should be that they were not careless at all they just didn't know and i think i was such a a good kid responsible and uh, serious that they trusted me and they did well because that uh, opened the doors for everything. And I took my responsibility very early on. And um, I think it taught me everything. I remember talking to a interviewing a sports psychologist for this podcast once and talking to him about children who become professionals at, you know, the age that you're speaking of, the age that you did. And one of the traits that he said in personality of them is they're usually very mature for their age. They usually have to grow up very fast. And that kind of allows them to live in the world of adults, which is, sounds like what you were able to do. How did that affect you then growing up? Do you feel like you missed out on any parts mm-hmm. of being a teen, being a child? Mm-hmm. I definitely did not have the, you know, the years that you experiment drugs and mm. doing this and that and nothing and i'm so grateful for it like it's i missed to my uh, in my opinion i missed nothing i just had the opportunity to grow faster and to do what i wanted to do i hate it to be told and that way the fact that they let me get in the world of adults and even sometimes thinking it was an adult because sometimes we even had with the company to lie about my age to send me in some cities to to do some gigs i never felt i missed on something like how could i feel i missed on procrastinating like just being in the streets smoking glue (laughs) i don't know if there were there were kids doing some (laughs) wild stuff in my village i'm so grateful that i had a way out of that not completely wow. and it was my way out happened to be my passion how wonderful like it's not like i was doing some modeling job and thrown into some terrible like, i was doing what i loved and i was so focused and i was uh, yeah no 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 missing at all ever i just love i love my childhood did you ever go through like a rebellious phase at all? Or are, have you just been Erica LeMay this whole time? I guess I went through many rebellious <laughs> phases here and there, you know. <laughs> I think sometimes yeah. I was 18 and I thought that it was cool that I went to dance and clubs at night and drink alcohol. And I thought, well, this is leading me nowhere. It took me like two, <laughs> two weeks maybe to figure that out. I was just focused and no, um, I've never wanted to be the cool kid I guess I just mm. knew where I was where I was going and the sky was not the limit there was no limit and I would conquer the world and I still have this naive childlike thinking today and this is so wonderful and I'm so grateful that I think that way like I, I did not grow into a bitter older ish person <laughs> um <laughs> I'm like, I look at every day like a, a land of opportunity and just let's conquer the world. I know how to do it. This is, I'm going to lay down everything I have to do in order to get to my, my goal. And I keep doing that with so much enthusiasm. Yeah, that, that was actually my next question about goals was when you were, you know, in South America and training all the, like long after the show or this focus, this intense focus you're talking about. What was your goal or did you even have one? Like what where were you trying to get to? I think that the goal evolves. Like our goals evolve with uh with ourselves. So a lot of goals are more a direction and they become obsolete after a few years because now you're elsewhere, but they did serve a purpose. And at the hmm. time it was true mini goals here and there that would be stepping stone to the next goal it was to become i would say or i would have said at the time to become the best of the world 
But what I would say nowadays, it was more to become the best I could become to mm. really to push the boundaries that pretty much everyone. And I think, I guess every artist that went somewhere, they had that in common. There's always the world to tell you that these are your limits. And I am so happy that I did not listen to them. I was just, I did not like to see limits and I just wanted to become better and better and better. And, you know, a little bit, we, and we can get there later on, but the, the hand balancing, you know, I have been told very early on not to practice hand balancing because this was not for my body type. And we would not make you lose time in your company hours of training for that because this is going nowhere. So you would put your hours elsewhere. Okay. And I used four more hours every day after my eight hours of training to do what I wanted to do. I don't care what you think. <laughs> and what made me world famous, maybe the hand balancing, you know, that's just... So yeah, to get back to clearly to your question, to become the best in the world to become the best slash of myself, I guess, because I never competed with the world, even at this age. I um, I competed with myself, sometimes a little bit too um, harshly, as mm. maybe you do when you lack experience, but um, yeah. Yeah, whenever I have a friend who's getting into handstands and they're m like bemoaning their career and they're like, oh, I'm never going to be a hand balancer because I don't have a one-arm handstand, I'm like, I show them your like uh, one of your hand balancing videos, and I'm like, "Look at this gorgeous act. Do you care that she doesn't have a one arm handstand in this act?" And it like lights people's vision up to what is possible because I think what's so amazing and striking about your work as a hand balancer is what you were saying earlier about being tall and being this stick. Your your lines go on forever. You just have this like frame that it's it's so striking and so different in hand balancing because you don't look like the traditional hand balancer who does just like trick, 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 you know? There's, um, if you will, a physical poetry. I just want to paint a picture for everybody out there. Like, how tall are you exactly? <laughs> I love this question because you know what? <laughs> I, I am very short. Oh no! Yeah, surprise, surprise. <laughs> I'm not, I mean, I look tall with acrobats because they are so short. Right. And my proportion, like, I look so tall if I'm by myself on stage because my proportions are so wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm completely, I have weird proportions. So I have a, two long legs for my trunk. It's like I have no trunk. So if I'm seated in a car, I don't see anything. But I'm only, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm five foot three ish, like between five to five three. Wait, what? You're like my height. <laughs> I'm just very <laughs> petite. So I look, I, 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 yeah, I have like wrists and, and ankles that are so tiny and knees that I, I look 5'10", 5'11". And actually, when I was a kid, they told me I would be 5'11", 5'10". When I was about, huh. I don't know, 11? Because I, I stopped growing at 11, I was that height. I was so tall when I was 11, but then I stayed like that. <laughs> wild. Did you just like drink a bunch of coffee or something? Like what was your secret? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny, but it's, it's like that in my family. The, okay, um, the girls, okay. they stopped growing like, a, like growing in, in height. Not in, um, yeah, we can get bigger as much as we want, but in height. Right. Um, yeah, at 9, 11, I'm the, yeah. 11, 12. Max. Oh my God, that's too funny. Yeah. I have that experience sometimes too. Actually, people will meet me in real life and be like, oh, I thought you were taller. And I'm like, oh, what? I get Why? that what? all the time. But yeah, you, I can imagine get that because I thought I was talking to like a 6'3 woman over here. Oh, like, this is so funny. Like, oh, I love that because you know that I've been, a, I've been a flyer for so long before they know I had like three decades of career. So I've been a, a Korean cradle flyer. Because I, I'm petite, so I'm light. And I've been a hand-to-hand -hand flyer as well with a woman for so many years. So Cool. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm short. But yeah, I'll, I'll send short you a, I have to send you a picture of me by a car. Because when people are, think I'm lying, I do that. Uh, it's yeah. quite funny because now you can compare. 
<laughs> oh my um, god i'm cracking up it's too funny but uh wow. yeah but still my proportions are what they are you know my bones are little my muscles are very little and i can't charge so much on my frame or it would crack <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so gymnastics was not for me because i'm too yeah, little little joints right yeah. But I love what you said earlier about how circus really is something for all body types. You know, like there, there yes. there's just a different way to go about it for everybody. And I um, think that yeah. we would all benefit much more if we were not like tagging people out of this body, this discipline of circus. And that's the wrong way of approaching it. It's an art. It's not a sport. So you can really reinvent any kind of discipline you want, depending on what you want to do. And to get back to your your question about the um, the hand balancing and you, maybe some friends who think, oh my God, I don't have the technique to become a hand balancer. I hadn't had that question or that comment. Like at some point I was bullied because I didn't have one hand in my, uh, in my routine. A routine mm-hmm. that won medal around the world and went to Monte Carlo Circus Festival, won medal in Russia Circus Festival. And on purpose, I did not put one hand because I did not see the why I would need to stop, show, then transfer, then do. That was not my idea. And of course, I went through this imposter syndrome at some point that I did need to stand like three minutes on one hand in order to call myself a hand balancer. And after, I think I started maybe hand balancing when I was a... I was a hand-to-hand flyer, but I started to really practice perhaps in 2001. And I released my act in 2005 and I started to tour the world with it. And I felt so bad about the fact that I could not nail the basics, even if like in 2008 already I was representing Circus Life for all their press launch of shows around the world. And I was really, the act that I had made was now I can I can say it. It was a great quality. It was a good mm-hmm. act. But I still felt there's something wrong. So I stopped at some point. I took a sabbatical to go s- study in uh, China one-on-one with a master that, w- that wanted to be beaten a little bit, you know, to get to stand on one hand forever and do some. And mm-hmm. only when I got there, when I understood that I was was this kind of superstar what i could do for them was impossible was so beautiful and insane they all wanted to be me and i understood that i was just stupid i was just trying to be i had even i was brainwashed about you need to do that in order to be able to be in the market and actually what made me so interesting for the world of show business was that i was different was that i was presenting something that the audience hadn't seen a thousand times and I could not even, even I could not see that. Mm-hmm. So I think that very often we would, and that's difficult because you always compare yourself to some level to the world, but I, I should talk for myself. I really started to like flow high when I, when I understood that my shortcomings because there are somehow it's how my body is built would be tools for my success. So for me, the basics of hand balancing for many reasons, also um, anatomically speaking, my um, elbows, they don't, they're not completely straight. There was a little bent. That's weird because my, my legs are over, over extensions, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, which makes it difficult for me, um, muscularly speaking to hold, on uh, on one yeah. hand because I'm always like on the verge of uh, falling so it's very muscularly demanding I was fighting against that for years and you know training eight hours a day in order to do these movements and I was I, I lost so many years and when I decided to let go and actually push my um, because I have body qualities that others don't have and when I started to just put all of my time on that oh my god like this is was this was the beginning. It was a huge potential. I could become the product that I was creating could become something so amazing. But unless I would let go of that stupid, I need to nail these movements. Why? For whom? Like we're not doing the Olympics here. We don't need to 
do the the program, the short program, and then you have to do these movements yes. and that and that. Like we chose to be artists, not robots. When I got that yes. part, and stupid me, I had to fly all the way to China and then to cancel <laughs> one year. And all of my gigs, I said no, and because I needed to become what I wanted to become <laughs> here. Well, it took that for me to understand that I did not owe anything to anyone and I could be proud of myself. But it, uh, and I was already in international stages winning the international medals and that could not get into my little brain. You know, it's, uh, mm. it's funny that that was the very moment that I understood that I was holding a gem in my hands and I could not even see it for so long. That's an incredible story. Thank you for sharing. I feel like that will save a lot of people a lot of trips to China, <laughs> just hearing it from you. <laughs> yeah. Going off of that, talking about playing into your strengths as an artist, something you, you wrote a section of your book in the email you sent me, this amazingly prepared email that I almost feel like I'm cheating in this interview because I have like, guys, maybe I'll post it on the Patreon, like the Q&A that you sent me because it's so good. And I want to ask you like every single question, but I know we don't have the time for that. That's so nice. Can um, I ask you to please correct two little typos that are in there? I saw that today oh, and sure. I felt terrible. <laughs> <laughs> or like, I think there's one verb that is not properly conjugated. Uh, I don't know, something like that. We're going to post it the way it is and just have people skewer you for yes. it. They're going to be like, oh, she's terrible. This she all, should this woman have written thinks a book. She, <laughs> she thinks she's an author. Oh my she God. She calls herself a writer. <laughs> Look at this <laughs> verb conjugation. She only speaks six languages. <laughs> my God. <laughs> no, but um, something you wrote in the email, you said, I you were talking about casting talents for upcoming productions and you say it saddens me how little personality is out there and how there's so much undeveloped potential in circus. And I, I love that you wrote that. I, I hate that it's true, but I love that you wrote that because I think it's true. And something you said at the beginning was you were so blown away by how when you went to that little circus school in Quebec City that there was so many big personalities just like yours, people who wanted to be the only one on stage. And I do get this feeling now that there's less of that personality. And it seems like you do as well. Do you know what would you attribute that to? Or what do you, how do you see that working in the world? Um, first of all, of course, I don't hold the truth. I only have my opinion here. But um, there are two things. I think that a lot of people get caught into the trend of the moment. And if you've been around, mm. because like some of us are grandmas of uh, the show business, <laughs> if you've been around for a while, mm -hmm. you remember the era of the velours costumes and the tango trapeze. And then it, uh, you know, all of these trends. And then it became the <laughs> I dress terribly and I wear socks and then I do a hand balancing routine and we can't see your feet. So all of these trends and like at the moment, the, the straps trend that and I don't know if it's driven by social media or the fact that we didn't have so much exposure before. You know, we could not mm -hmm. see so much online. And actually, for the record, I am someone who does not consume YouTube, social media, etc. I do not use other people's product to inspire myself. It's never been my way of creating, I think. And I think it's um, it saved me a little bit because it did not sidetrack me to, oh, no, but... Like this is what sells at the moment. So as an artist, number one, I think that if you create for what sells at the moment or what is needed on the market, you think is needed because that's the only thing you see, you're doomed to fail because this trend mm. will change. And developing a stage personality or a um, language of movement does not take two years or five years, which is maybe the time of a trend, it takes much longer. So if you follow mm. the trend, when it changes, you need to start all over again. And then you move with a bunch of uh, sheep all together, left and right. <laughs> what about you take your own point skills, body, personality, and you just make it bigger and develop it? And this is what being an artist is, I think. And that also works for the skills, for the technique, because of course I so much love high technique. I'm not, uh, mm -hmm. I, the most important is the aesthetic, the way that you will present it, but I will never be this person who 
to the split forever and nothing else because that creates applause. Yeah, so in terms of, of personality creation or like artistic identity on stage, I think that we should totally forget about the trends and move with it and do this uh, whatever is trendy at the moment because this is doomed to fail. And the second part of your question is that, so I think I dedicated 25 years of my life only to be on stage. I was directing shows, but it was not my priority. So I could only see me, it was very navel-gazing, let's be honest. I could mostly see me and, and how I wanted me to become on stage, even if I was directing others. But when I changed because of this uh, catalyst that has happened, and I was looking for talents to convey physical poetry and some shows that I was uh, putting together, I found so many amazing talents, but I incredibly, like, I started to consume <laughs> YouTube and Instagram, to be honest, and mm. so many, wow, 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 like, this is completely insane. And yet I could not hire this person because this was still at, at the stage of potential and no personality was there. There was no, I don't know, it's like it did not blossom into something unique. It was just a bunch of corps de ballet, you know, the corps de ballet, they all need to be pretty much yeah. the same and never together. The backup dancers. They have not to point their foot too much because then you see only that foot. So that's supposed to be the prima ballerina. It was a bit that feeling that I had, like everyone had evolved to be a little bit the same. So I am still having a hard time at hiring what I am looking for. <laughs> and maybe we will have to, you will have to... <laughs> make people rethink about their itinerary, artistic itinerary to really develop their own potential. Wow, Erica, thanks. That is <laughs> that's a very big mission you've just put in front of me. There you go. Let me let me <laughs> <laughs> I've got your future. Erica's like, I need more casting, Shannon. Get these people to figure it out. Yes, I want that ready in five years. <laughs> So let me ask you this. Um, when you're looking at all this undeveloped talent, like how do you spot developed talents? Like what is it, if you can even put it into words, because I know that this is a very, um, uh, there's like a je ne sais quoi to like what people have sometimes, but I'm wondering if you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that personality or that developed talent? What are signs to you that a person has that confidence in their artistry that you can hire them or cast them? That is someone that I can put on stage alone and will keep mm -hmm. my eyes the whole time. I'm very bored easily. So for me, 10 seconds and I understood like, okay, you can do your skills. I'm off. If you get me and I can't, I can't take my eyes off of you, whatever is it that you're doing, you have me. And this is more and more rare. And, you know, to get it back to the first time that I entered this circus space, there were more personalities like that. They were more mm. completely. So perhaps now there's a lot of talent that you can put into a um, bigger cast like Cirque du Soleil-like show that you just put big costume on them and make them do what is supposed to be doing like the creation was 10 years ago. Maybe there's more of that. And by all means, great. that That's amazing that they got these skills and so on. But for my type of... Uh, my market, I I need something else. I need it's it's more broad show business, but the um, the means of transportation is the acrobatics. But you need yeah. to offer something before you need to catch the audience's heart. Yeah. So maybe the, yeah, the the short answer would be someone that I put alone on stage without a lot of fla fla and. Uh, pyrotechnic and pyrotechnic and so on and that <laughs> they can everyone's in awe and silent that's such a cool answer oh hey there i just wanted to interrupt this interview real quick to just say one real quick little thing about myself which is that i am not only the host of the artist athlete podcast no 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 she is a business woman and i run a whole company dedicated to the education and inspiration of circus artists that goes from people who are just doing it weekend warriors as a hobbyist recreationally or if you're a professional you've put in the hours and you need more resources go to the artist 
thebestathlete.com. There are a ton of recorded workshops, online manuals and ebooks, everything you could possibly need from me and from some guests on this show about everything from nutrition to training your shoulders to really specific aerial moves that you need to master. Again, theartistathlete.com. And just because you went there from listening to this podcast, use code podcast and get 15% off your entire purchase. That's right. Theartistathlete.com. Use code podcast at checkout for 15% off your entire purchase and have a great day. Back to the episode. Before we continue, I would really love to kind of go over time, but I want to be sensitive to your time. Do you have a little bit more time or do you have to run off to another meeting? No, I have time. I took a, uh, we have a big chunk of time. Oh, Erica, you're fabulous. All right. I love that you say that you didn't for a long time consume any social media or YouTube or anything, and you kind of let yourself be in that bubble of inspiration that was just yours. But I'm curious. Because I do think that there is a balance that needs to happen between understanding the context of the market, you know, and being with other artists and sharing and seeing what's going on, um, and then also having your own inner voice. Do you know what I mean? That balance? Yeah, absolutely. Do you agree with that? Or <laughs> I first of all, I'd like to say. Perhaps I did not consume so much. Just it, it's just an egocentrical type mm -hmm. of my personality. I I don't like to watch a video. I I don't. I'm not interested. And the other thing is that I had barely no time to spend just surfing social media or else. I produce on social media for the sake of that's a platform, a visual platform, and that's a way to share our art. But my days have always been so filled and packed up that it was not part of my days, but I don't think it's um, it's a bad thing to do so to, to a certain extent. And it's probably good to live also in a community and understand. However, to understand the, con the, the, the concept of, or the, the market of the moment, that I'm not sure. It depends mm. what is your goal. My goal mm. was to create my own path and to bring the crowd with me. So it was not to... Mm to try to speak a language, to express what is supposed to be received. I wanted to teach the audience my own language, my own type of art. So that was my own choice. I would never have adapted my products. I don't like to call it that way, but uh, in yeah. if someone pay, pays for it, it's, it becomes a product. I don't like to adapt it to the market, what the market needs. I like to do what I want to do. And I'm mostly inspired by philosophy, uh, neoclassical architecture, beauty, visual beauty. Like it doesn't need to be who's doing the next uh, flag in the, you know, <laughs> that, 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 that yes. is of no interest for me. <laughs> because also in my market, I'm not, I really, I removed myself from the circus world. I think the last thing I did was uh, the Festival de Cirque de Monte Carlo. And I thought I had finished, like I, th I thought I was done with that. And I thought, okay, one last, it's 10 years ago, but I removed myself from that market and I really chose a path, I created a path that uh, my core market is more um, high end, high end events and uh, more like my celebrities and the TV, but no circus. So they don't care about uh, what is supposed to be hard or not. I did these skills for myself, but not for what is mm. supposed to be received. I, when I let go also of performing for competitions and so on, I started to shift towards what, what is really amazing to see. What, and that's how I build maybe the, the hand balancing routine that you're talking about. That's how I wanted mm. to build it. I wanted it to be an A to Z dance on hands, not the trick after trick. Yes. I want to shift over now. There's another sentence that you wrote that goes to a blog article called Why I Wrote Almost Perfect, and I'll link it in the show notes. But you say that you made a 180-degree shift in your life three years ago. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what happened and what caused that shift? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from the age of four, I have really dedicated my life to my craft. I didn't know it when I was four, but... Eventually, it became clear, especially. Um, so, if we continued um, 
the storyline where we left it at. When I was 19, I decided to quit the company. I was uh, working for Sir Chaos and became freelance. I did that to really conquer the world with my own type of art. And that's when I um, created physical poetry. So that would not just be circusy performances, but really physical poetry, what, uh, what I explained, what we went through a little bit. And so for decades, really, my whole life was improving my craft. But millimeter after millimeter, everything, I had no, nothing extra. That was the only thing that I gravitated around for decades. Um, just to give you a few examples, I did not drink a drop of alcohol for 10 years. I would go to bed at nine o'clock because I knew that I needed to wake up with the sun because that's better for my training. Like everything, <laughs> what people would call biohacking. So it was all about <laughs> helping my performances. And my schedule was really hopping on the plane every other day. I was most of the time in three different countries a week because my market being international and in the gala, what, what other called gala events. Yeah. It's, you know, one day it's in Germany. Then the next day I'm in Los Angeles. Then I have to go to Dubai. Then I have to go to New Delhi. It was just a dis disorganized or graphical, impossible schedule. So I lived like that. And I, I think that my nearest, uh, person was my art and I really and this is not like I'm not sad about that that was wonderful and this was real dedication and commitment and I had a stage accident I'm sorry wait I have to interrupt before we get into <laughs> yeah. the accident because I have a lot of questions about what you just were were you at any time lonely did you ever like stop and were like man I really wish someone was on this flight with me or did you ever have any kind of feeling of that? Or were you just like doing the thing? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Many, I don't know if I can call it lonely. You know, I'm, I'm for sure a loner, <laughs> but I have mm, very, okay. yeah, I don't need a lot of people around me. I have very, very deep and good friendship and I have great relationship with my family. You know, I'm, I'm blessed for, for if, if we yeah. talk about that, like, but I don't have a lot of um, acquaintances or not my friends. They're acquaintance. So right. This is a very this is a very non where I'm from yeah. in America. Like a friendship is a very loose thing, and I really love this European kind <laughs> of outlook on like no you you got to earn a friendship. Mm -hmm. Friendships are much deeper than just meeting someone and being like oh she's my friend. You know yeah I yeah you know often I think if. If you're my friend, that's because I have an accident and you're taking the next flight and you're canceling your life and like losing a hell of a lot of money to <laughs> go yeah. meet me to yes. like be the one who dressed me in the morning <laughs> because I can't move anymore. Yeah. So I don't know if I was lonely, probably sometimes, but who is not? You can be lonely in a relationship. You can be lonely with a bunch of people mm. around you. So I uh, prefer to be lonely alone. <laughs> no, but, but yeah. all in all, like a, in a very fulfilled and, and happy way, I chose this uh, life path. I think what I love about what you're describing is going back to that discussion of personality. I think sometimes there's this idea that in order to be a person with personality, you have to be kind of the rebel or the fuck up or <laughs> like, like somehow destructive. And what I love about your kind of description of yourself during this time, this discipline, this commitment, is that you were still very much a personality pursuing art, having a point of view, being super specific, being all the things that I think make a great artist, but not in a way that was like destroying the self. Yeah. It was very much fulfilling yeah. the self. And I love that you're making those statements and putting that out there because I think sometimes the self-destructive artist is a very dangerous um, vision that people think that they have to go towards to be interesting. So I just wanted to like stop and point that out. That is uh, amazing that you do that because I think that we are mistaken when the, maybe I, I thought that when I was a teenager at some point and I'm happy that I mm. let that thought go. But yeah, you're not you're not cool because you're torn apart and everything is difficult but that does create a lot of clicks so it sells you know it sells mm. magazines it's mm. what can we say yeah 
Anyway, getting back to the uh, <laughs> my original question, as I so rudely interrupted myself and you. So you had an accident. Yeah. So I and I had the biggest season, and I would have been the moment of my life because I really worked to arrive where I was. Like mm-hmm. I, it was choices. It's not like a poor me, but I really worked like sixteen hours a day, my whole life, trying to become bring my art up and up and up and up and then bang (laughs) Um, on stage I had an accident and I ended up um, let's say to say it nicely my arm was detached from my body so um, just you were you were doing handstands right I was uh, I was on my hands on my high canes and uh, it's funny because now I can I can say the the movement and people will understand because in other a circus, the, the crowd is circus people. So I was in a Mexican, very, very deep Mexican on hands and uh, all the weight went on my left hand. And somehow there's one tendon, I think that uh, just tore completely and everything else just popped mm-hmm. out. Everything else was torn completely. So, and Luckily, the skin remained there, but everything else was torn. So the the arm was mainly not holding. And it was also dislocated at that very moment. And so I fell on the floor. I um, (laughs) have not passed out. God knows why. So no one (laughs) came to save to me. So I took my arm and myself and I stepped off stage to meet some uh, very traumatized technicians who were not ready to face um, this and who was you know some people are not able to see that so instead of helping you they they kind of half pass out and are useless so um i was completely composed and thought okay next step and i say composed but also extremely ashamed i uh, ashamed Mm. of doing that to my clients and to have like i was in my head i was always unbreakable and now i just broke in in front of everyone and this was so terrible like to to see it and to that i did like i did not even think oh my god well now i'm handicapped like i lost an arm i I was just ashamed and i uh, okay solution i probably have to go to the hospital which is going to be terrible you know i don't want to have to wait uh, like that and i've been so lucky because there was um the one of the best surgeon specialists of shoulders that was seated in the first row in Italy. Yeah, oh my gosh. at the border lock. So he he saw that he understood what happened. He didn't know it was as bad as it was because then when I had the MRI, they went like, uh oh. <laughs> mm. So he came backstage and uh, we talked. I was on the floor and everyone was panicking, and so we talked and uh, I agreed that he would put back the shoulder in this socket so at least I could have uh, I could feel a little bit more like a human being and then I flew to Asia to uh, get every I was directing a show the next day so we taped my shoulder and then I started I started the MRI and so on in uh, in Bangkok and then we understood that everything was destroyed like everything um, I needed a shoulder reconstruction and uh, I went to have the surgery in Singapore and the um, uh, bone marrow transplant and so on. Like It's been a, a heavy, heavy surgery and rehab. It took me three months to be able to only, you know, it's not like you go to rehab and you, you're you doing with your elastic bands and so on. No, like for me to just move my arm to perhaps one day hold a cup of tea. Let's talk about that for next year. It was, um, it was a a longer right. because everything the tissues were so damaged and so like mm. and miraculously this shoulder is uh I, I don't know why this happened to me like okay i committed all of my life to do this rehab as much as i put into my craft in the first place but it's amazing it's much better than the other one now i would like to have the same surgery on the other one the shoulder is like a super shoulder <laughs> now yeah but that changed my life because in one second it um, yeah just put an end to my dream or my I wouldn't say dream because I had lived that dream already but to my plan and um, I need to redirect my energy first I needed to find a way not to be handicapped forever so that was my first um, priority at that time 
and then to create a future that I would have had to create anyway, because of course we all have to retire from uh, stage life. But I thought I still had many lives, many lives, many years in front of me. Um, mm -hmm. So it just came faster, and um, I was busy also, yeah, what uh, doing what the rehab does, and it was uh, difficult the surgeries and so on, and. Uh, you know, you don't have as much energy when you're on a hundred thousand pills and uh, opioids, and but mm -hmm. um, yeah, that uh, changed everything, and I'm so grateful that it happened because now that I finally, I mean, fast forward, I got back on stage and I had retired. I only retired myself recently because of many reasons, but one of them is that I had this strong will of creation with my body and at some point i was just create creating with my body not to put the creation on stage to then teach it to other people and for my for my production but my body was in the best shape ever so i thought why not i mean mm. if i have more to say why not and now i'm uh, i'm back on stage completely so i have a hard time to manage my time now because i still produce shows perform and have the other company Le Malab, um, which is the supplement company. So I, I have to find uh, some clones of myself soon. <laughs> yes. Yeah. One of the questions that came in from listeners was managing now that you're an entrepreneur and like, not that you weren't before, because I want to make it very clear mm -hmm. that freelancing and running physical poetry and being the type of artist who does galas and gets flown all over the world is very much a business endeavor. But now you have that, and you have a company that actually like produces a physical product, um, the supplements. Um, how how do you like how many hours do you have in a day? Because it seems like you have more than twenty four. Um, <laughs> how do you do it all? <laughs> I learned that pretty early on to be very well. Um, I have a my planning. Is amazing. I think my planning skill is amazing mm. and is uh, built out of my priorities. Now they have shifted, so I just change my plan and I'm very effective, which gives me time to have fun in life. It's not just like I work, 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 but in a disorganized way. It's very organized, but when I turn off everything, I turn off everything and I have, I can have a life. Like, not that I don't have a life whilst I'm working, but you know, I have an amazing relationship. I spend time, quality time with the person I love. I, we go skiing, for example, things like that, that probably if I was not organized would not be possible. So I think, first of all, that's one of my, um, as boring as it sounds, that's one <laughs> of my key. Um, the discipline of, yeah, never. And one, just a step back by being organized in a way that like in prioritizing also, there's no procrastination. Yeah. There's no space for that. It's just like today, this mm. is the plan, A, B, C, D, E. And, and then there's so much time left for the rest. Now that uh, I start to, to have a lot of productions again, uh, thank God, uh, because the pandemic is starting mm -hmm. to ease out a little bit and uh, my clients are yes. coming back and I physical poetry has picked up again. So I was working on Lima Lab uh, 12 hours a day at some point and now I... Now I'm a little bit in trouble, so I, I am hiring people. But um, yeah, just to make the right choice. I think that to look at the yeah. picture, priorities, make the right choice, make a schedule, a plan that is for the six months to come, and perhaps also taking into consideration the five years to come. You can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not just that I'm not juggling day to day what's going on here because then I would be so under the water. I, I could not even psychologically, I could, I could not manage that. But uh, like, for example, when I, after the, um, the surgeries, <laughs> after, after the accident, when I, mm -hmm. um, I was mainly six hours a day, I was doing re rehab, which a lot of that was just me being on a bed and, uh, having needles put inside of me and uh, I was writing the book in my head and then I would write in the morning and at night and this was my these were my priorities and everything else I shut it off and I think I'm good at doing that at uh, putting things in compartment I think the word is compartmentalizing yeah. which is a long word mm -hmm. <laughs> yes <laughs> um, and then I get things done I don't think that's I think everyone can do that break down 
big goals and small little things and get them done. Well, and I love that it comes from a place of uh, the word priority, I think is so cool. And not just like a priority because you think someone else should, you should do it for someone else, but because it fits into your vision for your life. Mm -hmm. um, that's super, super smart. And I think yeah. what I should say yeah. in order to properly build that plan and prioritizing in the right way, not in the wrong way, like you said, if not to please anything else that is coming at the moment, is where do you want to be in 10 years? And then then mm. go to shorter, like shorter five years. Where do I need to be in five years to be there in 10 years? What does it mean on a day-to-day -day basis? And I reassess every six months if I went really up to where I wanted. And you know, there are goals. You, you can't write a book, and writing is not the big deal, it's publishing it, but you can't publish a book in six months it's it's doesn't work so you need to just break it down into smaller tasks and uh yeah and things are suddenly you look at it and it's done right and i love you're talking about reassessing because i think sometimes people think that when you make a goal or a plan that you have to stick to that and if you don't stick to it then you failed in some way <laughs> you know yeah this is forgetting that goals become obsolete because, hey, you know what? We evolved. <laughs> yeah. How amazing. So, yes. you know, if, if you look at yeah. uh, what kind of house you wanted to live in 10 years ago, chances are <laughs> not now. Thank you. <laughs> mm. No, it's completely different. Though I do still want to live in the house that I wanted to live in when I was like five years old that has like ball pits and slides oh, wow. and stuff. So, wow. yeah. Yeah. I feel like. You are the exception <laughs> to the rule. Well, I think that there was a point in my life where I like tried to evolve past that or think of something more mature <laughs> and I'm coming back around to like leaning into my like really the inner wants that are really a little bit more like childlike, you know, and being like, oh, I can really build anything I want, you know, that sky's the limit and then past the mm. sky, believing that. That's so cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a constant reminder, kind of what you were talking about in art about not comparing yourself to other people. But I think that that transcends to life as well. People think that there's a certain type of house that if you have that, you'll be happy. Or if you look like everyone else, then you'll, uh, then it'll work out. But actually like when you sit down and have goals that are actually your own, uh, that's when prioritizing and these things become oh very God, easy. Oh my God, yes. And I think we would all benefit from looking inwards much more. And you know, the you mm. mentioned there's a type of house that you can look at and you think that if you have that, you're happy. Probably like that sounds so weird to me at, on, on the spot, but then I thought, oh yeah. And that's why even physical trends, like big lips, big eyebrow thing like that, that wouldn't have been accepted 10 years ago, now are a thing. And if you're not into the Instagram crowd or TikTok whatsoever, you think like, ah, why do people like that? Like, I don't, I've never seen that. I've never seen that in real life. It, this is bizarre. We all were brainwashed little by little. I'm giving you two big examples of maybe let's look at 10 years ago. No one had big, big eyebrows and big lips uh, because they shot, uh, I don't know how much uh, acid in their fillers. But yeah. now it's, it's okay. We don't even see that it's not natural anymore because little by little they get brainwashed. Yeah. No, it's so true. So imagine in art so <laughs> where, where the trend changes every other <laughs> second. I want to ask a bit about your company, Malab. Is that what it's called? Am I saying it? Le Malab. Le Malab. Yes. Yes. What inspired you to get into the, is supplement the right word yeah, to use well, for it? We sell supplement, but it's, it's much more than that. I think it's really a, a lifestyle designer. Think of Goop, but for elite performance. Oh, work. So... We also yeah, work with a lot of scientific uh, journalists and uh, there's a laboratory behind uh, supplements, obviously. And there, there's much more than we just sell one thing. It's, it englobes the how to get better at, uh, ex excuse me, how to upgrade yourself in order to reach an elite level for mm. performers. And also taking into account the, the needs, the stress we put on our bodies, you know, we... We can't just consume whatever else is consuming because it's trendy again. It doesn't fit our lifestyle. So mm -hmm. I want science, science backed evidence and all of that, which I have been consuming 
a bit too much for 25 years myself. <laughs> I now produce it with the right entities, the right competent people, but, uh, but I, I make it available to, to the world. I'm just kind of the messenger and the person who decided to put so much money into a company as well <laughs> that, uh, that would sell that. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a big leap. Did you work with anyone? Did you have a business? Like, I couldn't even imagine. Like, building the business I'm building is stressful and difficult, and I need so much help with it, you know, to do what I'm doing. I can't imagine actually making, like, a, a physical product that people put into their bodies. Yeah. You know, like, how did you did you meet someone? How did you get started with this? I, I knew I wanted to do that someday. So I gathered the information for a long time, but it, obviously regulation changes and I want to be super compliant with all the certifications needed. And if you produce a product for consumption in the EU, it's, uh, it's very, mm -hmm. very thorough. It's much more than in the US yes. or Canada or other market. It would be a little bit like in Singapore, very thorough market. Um, I got the information little by little, <laughs> just uh, building the business. And when it comes to what I want to share in terms of information, that, that was a little bit the business was built for what I would have wanted to exist. So for my whole life, mm -hmm. I've been super conscious about supplementation. I'm someone who takes blood tests and knows about all the blood mark markers, at least the 43 more important every six months. And then I really okay. have to be in my best range, not just the, you have your yearly blood test and a doctor says, oh, all good. Man, all good not. <laughs> not for someone who's training like that. or who, And then whenever you have something very bad happening, they, oh yeah, this is out of range. Well, it has been out of range forever, but you've never seen it. Or, so um, I've been very deep into that for years. So already I had the knowledge. Um, I was consuming uh, some supplements, for example, the collagen peptides for years. And then I, I had my kind of go-to supplements. So I would take the raw material and consume them, like make it myself from home, take the best raw materials in the world, have them shipped. We invested so much energy, time, knowledge into that. And instead of having to do that, now I just have a lab that does that, put it in one pot and uh, it's the best for anti-inflammation and re regeneration of your joint and soft tissue, tendons, ligament. So you're not getting injured as easily. So you recuperate better after a training. So you have more mobility so everything that I was using, now I just give it for a affordable price because me personally, because it did not exist, I had to just get it all over the world and uh, try to get the best clean sources. It's also something I learned is the supplement market is terrible, is um, not regulated yeah. enough. I have to say I would love more regulation and I'm trying really to get the the most regulation I can get. So whenever the markets in every country, they ask for more, I already have that paper. Because I will not, I have my face on that brand. I will not uh, produce something that has a risk of heavy metal in it. And you know what? A lot of supplements have heavy metal in them. Or they say they have something that they don't even have because the milligrams are not what they pretend it is. It's not being checked. Every huh. single batch of products are being third party tested in a lab in Germany, which, you know, I don't know if you know Germans, but they won't do things approximately <laughs> if they put the oh, seal of quality. Uh, whenever I try to explain <laughs> German regulation to people, I talk about how one time I got a haircut in Germany and like the woman brought out a ruler. There was a ruler involved in my haircut. So yeah, they yeah. are the, the so, most So, you know, precise. all of that is uh, yes, you are right. Absolutely time consuming. But I think my big... Um, skill in there is that I'm not afraid of learning what I don't know yet and to spend mm. I'm, I'm a bit of a crazy person who can spend 20 hours an hour learning about that exact thing and I can't sell my whole life for the next 20 hours I just do that and I'm gonna get through it and I will know it and that mm. would, then it's done so little by little got things done and I'm very 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 proud of what I, we produced, I have a lot of people behind me so far and how it's going and the quality. So I uh, regret nothing. There are some choices that cost me um, a few tears. <laughs> Very, you know, when you're faced with an, an enormous amount, but you do need to 
go through that process of certification. And like, oh my God, I'm ruined now. Yes. But now I'm so happy I did it. So, and that's ah. a little bit thanks to the pandemic that showed me that maybe show business will be on hold for <laughs> a while. So I thought, okay, mm. let's go ahead with that company that I dreamt of, that I thought I would do when I would be 50 years old and I would ha- have a lot more money. I'll find a way. And um, this is it. And it's a community that is growing little by little, but in a quality way. And that I'm very happy about as well. Yes. Yes. I think that's right. And I think, um, yeah, I would much rather go little by little and earn success than blow up overnight and not know what to do with yeah, it all. But very sure. often, you know, there's yeah. uh, money offered to you for growing very fast and you can easily take that mm. door. But um, I mm. think this is not the long-term thinking and not thinking long-term is never, it's never a winner. <laughs> it's not your style. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ship to the US and Canada? I do. I do. Yeah. And now um, I think within the next eight weeks, uh, I know I should not talk about time uh, when we record this podcast because it's not live, <laughs> but we should be ready <laughs> to even have a warehouse in the US. So I have a US entity because Ooh, la la. the US market was growing so fast that yes. instead of shipping from the EU, which we do right now, and there's going to be a, a warehouse and um a U.S. Uh, sister company of Lema Lab. Yeah. Amazing. But yeah, I do wow. have a lot of customers there already. <laughs> mm. I can imagine, for sure. I'm about to become <laughs> one. So cool. <laughs> I'm reading over your sheet and I'm looking at something that keeps jumping out at me is this imposter syndrome. You talk about being in London and being applauded by Madonna and President Clinton and celebrities and telling you that you're great and not believing that. We've spoken a lot in this interview about how you've resolved some of this, but I'm wondering if even now you encounter some of this, especially as you're doing new things like starting a business, another business, I should say. Oh, I was not expecting this question. Um, (laughs) In all honesty, no. And maybe this is me being mature and self-assured. No. And I don't even... I think if if I was... If I had to face this again, it would not be because of the novelty. And, you know, of course, when I'm being interviewed by some health magazine and so on, they're like, well, but are you a chemist? No, dear. <laughs> it's not the, you know, I could feel right. that way, but I don't. I am very, everything is, is well done and I can explain everything. And I think I'm at, I'm at my place here. But I could feel that way when it comes to me being back on stage. At uh, I wouldn't say another level because I don't think I downgraded my level. I think I changed my level. I'm a more mature artist. I'm more efficient. Um, I think what I produce now and my shows are even better than when I was training eight hours a day, which is something I do not do anymore. So mm-hmm. I could feel this imposter syndrome now or feeling like, okay, you're supposed to be retired, but uh, I don't. I'm completely self-assured and... I reassess my choice. It's not like I'm there and I don't ask myself questions. I think every day I reassess all of my choices when I write in the morning. And if I keep going a direction, it's, uh, it's the right one. I think I'm, no, I don't feel that anymore. And it's funny, you're making me aware of it. I have not asked that question to myself. Thank you for that. Oh, you're <laughs> welcome. Cool. <laughs> you have a question on this sheet about, um, How can we as a society accompany our athletes when they retire? And I think this is a really cool question. I had um, uh, a guest on earlier who talked about going through the process of retiring and uh, how shocking it was to live in the quote unquote normal world, not on stage, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Do you think we should be more flexible with the structure we give to athletes and performers? Mm -hmm. How and how can we give them that structure? I'm assuming the answer to that question is yes. I would go back in time thinking that that preparation mm. should start from the very beginning, from the very foundation of a personality, thinking this is going to come sometimes. And if you have a very strong personality and you know that you can achieve everything because you know what skills are, are transferable, it would help a lot because a lot of athletes are people who are very doing like one thing very specific 
then it has to stop. And then they feel lost because like this is gone. Okay, now I start from scratch. You never start from scratch. You take your skills or your capabilities, your personality, and you just put them into something else, but they're still there. It's like me as a director, instead of me as a performer, you know that as a performer, I directed myself and I directed shows and I know everything about the job and because right. I was also looking at it. But first of all, to accept that you don't. It's not like, okay, you now hit a wall and you start from scratch. You take a step on the side and all of that, you use it for the future. And I think to give more um, responsibility. If, and again, that's a chance I had. If you do everything for someone or some entities, so if, if you're an artist and a, a, a freelancer, you will not have had that. So you already know you wear all the hats. But if you are in an entity mm -hmm. that everything was done for you and you were just like a little bird being fed every day, oof, we're not helping you. Like the retirement will be difficult. Mm. So start by questioning the structure before. Mm. I think it will be important. So would you suggest then a company like Cirque du Soleil support their artists less in a way? Always good to have a lot of support, but giving them responsibility. But I, I and you know mm, what? This is a really interesting yeah, distinction. Yes, I don't yes, know yes, if it yeah. should come from, it's difficult for me because I've always thought as an entity in the world, I am responsible for myself, for my failures and my success. Yes. So it's difficult for me always to, to put the blame on someone else or to to say that that the society should have done that with me i think it's us as individuals that should know that this is coming one day and we should be more responsible and but okay perhaps there are some companies that they do everything for you and then they don't let you move a finger in a different way so then you never learn that mm -hmm. so maybe there should be an exchange mm -hmm. an exchange there but because i'm so so concentrated on the 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 individual and self actualization and improvement self improvement i will always refer to you as an artist you should now take your responsibility and not just go with the flow only fish will go with the flow <laughs> that comes from the friend by the way <laughs> only fish yeah. go with the flow don't be a fish be a mermaid mm -hmm. Erica, is there anything that we haven't covered in this interview? I want, I'm slowly coming to the end, but I want to make sure that we've hit everything and um, anything that you want to plug. We've barely talked about your book, actually. I know. What I are know. we doing? No, but um... <laughs> we've mentioned it along the way that you started writing it when you were injured. It's called Almost Perfect. Yes, which is kind of a blueprint. No, it is not kind of. It is a blueprint for <laughs> elite performance of every mm. type. But uh, because I am a performer, a stage performer, if you are, it's even more um, for you. Um, it covers personality, career, health, and then redefining yourself. This little chunk after, or I should not say after because everything is a continuation. We will always redefine ourselves. We will have to go through many steps of life and we're not just living until 50 i mean we are having long lives and we can we can experiment many different things so but i think that just my answers in the even if we don't mention the book i don't mind because my answers and my way of seeing show business life getting things done is the book it's part of the book so if mm. you like what you're hearing then you might be interested in the content of the book and again, the link is in the show notes. Cool. So final question. What advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? And I guess we can say professional career. So when mm -hmm. you started getting those contracts, when you started getting paid, um, if you had a time machine and you could go back to that little Erica mm -hmm. and tell her something, what would you say? The choices that are the most interesting in the short run are probably not the right one. Always think long term. Will that be a service or a disservice to your career? And we don't do that as young people. I think I was doing it, but not to the extent I would have liked to. Um, if you make mistakes, that can be to appear in a way you will regret later. 
because now the show is paying you a lot of money or to abuse your body early on, you will regret it. Maybe if it, even if it gives you a lot of money right now or a lot of fame or whatever, think long term. Erica LeMay, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was a pleasure to have you today. Thank you. I love the way you conduct this interview and uh, I'm super honored to be here. That was my interview with Erica LeMay. Uh, As I was listening to the playback of this interview, I just kept writing down these awesome quotes that Erica would say, these like one-liners that just stuck out to me during the interview. And I want to read a couple of them off to you now. So the first one is, it's better to be over-prepared and then pretend you're talented. Erica said this when I made a comment about how she had basically done my job for me. I mean, Patreons, you'll see, she gave me this question list and all of these um, documents to prepare for the interview that I never get. I never expect anyone to send me um, before any of these interviews happen. And I was so impressed by that. And I think that this is something that uh, Erica does for her whole life. She spends hours a day training, preparing, so that she shows up and just pretends like things are effortless. I think that's really cool. The next one is our goals evolve with ourselves. So goals are more a direction. We had a little conversation about this mini conversation within the converse, the larger interview conversation, right? Where we were talking about how you can see a goal as like a milestone or something you have to get to. And it's this thing that is like you bleed for it, you cry for it, you sweat for it. And if you don't get it, you've somehow failed. And Erica, in this quote, suggests that we reimagine goals as just kind of like posts or markers along our way. So maybe you reach a goal, maybe you hit it in your journey, but really all it is is just that, a goal post in your journey that you move forward or move past, or maybe you see it in the distance, you set it there once, but you kind of decide that you don't actually want to get to it and you evolve and change. My um, parents in their house have this really cheesy, it's this big old rock that sits in the living room, and in it is etched, nothing is set in stone. And it's kind of the same reminder that like nothing you do, nothing you say, nothing is ever absolutely permanent, and you can change at any time. There's a lot of freedom in that, I think. The next quote is, what makes me so interesting is that I was different, not something the audience had seen a thousand times. I love this quote from Erica. She said it when she was talking about the story of going all the way to China to study hand balancing with this Chinese master. And she gets there and all the people she's training with can't do the things that she can do in a handstand, even though she's trying to learn what they can do. And she realized that she had something these other girls didn't. And it popped up to me this idea, I think I've said this before on the podcast, I definitely say it to myself all the time, that I don't want to be the best. I I don't think that being the best is the healthiest direction for me and probably for most people. I want to be the only. Because art is entirely subjective, right? As artist athletes, we are on these singular and subjective paths toward the thing that we want to create and we want to see in the world the most. And the best way to get to that is not by aspiring to be the best. It's by aspiring to be the most unique and the most like us, only us as individuals that we can be. Erica talks about this a little bit more in the last quote that I have written down. It says, my goal was to create my own path and have the crowd follow me. And Erica has certainly done that, writing a book, creating a supplement for physical artists, which is absolutely incredible. And all of the other work, galas, producing, directing that she does, she's really carved out her own path. If you want to learn more about Erica and everything we talked about today, you can go to her Instagram. It's at erica.lemay, and she's verified. Um, But there is a link tree that will tell you about all of that. 
And you can also check out the show notes for all of the links to all of the things. For aerial training tips and inspiration, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at the underscore artist underscore athlete. My Facebook is the artist athlete. I'm on TikTok, the artist athlete. And my website is theartistathlete.com. And if you love what you're listening to, you want to read that question sheet that Erica gave me. If you want to hear little clippets about my life every week, then you can subscribe on patreon.com slash the artist athlete. There won't be a podcast episode next week. I'm dealing with some personal stuff that Patreons you know about because you've been listening on the Patreon. But for the rest of you, thank you for tuning in this week, and I will talk at you in two weeks. Friends, fans, and foes, later days. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, my name is Noah, and I do hand balancing. Hi, my name is Woody, and I do Leo walk. Thank you for listening to the Artist Ashley Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Dominique, a ground acrobat, trapeze artist, and coach, currently bringing circus to the extremely cold but very beautiful Northern Ontario, Canada. Circus has changed my life and I'm so grateful to everyone in this community. Find me on Instagram at domupsidedown or my website domupsidedown.com. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slack lining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and swing and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we got a place for you.